Hollywood working class is that to organize I believe the masses will arrive Revolution will rise and decolonize It is time to mobilize In your was no time comes the balance of solution Starvation in our faces, making corruption Bout to see them plan my way to see Jongile The battle goes on, the struggle moves on I'm telling you, hell to the system It is time to break those chains and liberate our minds Hell to the system, it is time to break those chains and liberate our minds Liberate our minds Hello, comrades. Um, that song was Sabalasa, which means struggle in um, Zulu. And so I thought it was appropriate for the last session that we are having with this collective study. We will have two portions for the class today. The first one will be the lecture with Gabriel, and then we'll have a break. Our second session will be, um, we'll have an intervention by Brian, which will talk more to the party line. Again, the intention for this course is to kind of do a PSA, an introduction, um, and to be able to build the energy to continue to have these conversations in our different chapters and units um, and massify this this historical information but also what it means to our current context and how do we move forward so today a lot of what we'll be talking about is what is to be done so i that's that's my piece for now uh, i'll pass it on to gabriel and again thank you all it's really good to see you all thank you so much uh claudia and juan i did want to make sure there is an outline for this last session and I wanted to make sure that that was available to 
participants. It's the same thing that I've used in the past just to guide people through and give them some of the uh, content. And what I like to do with this section, this uh, final session is draw together a number of the threads from the discussions that we've been having and consolidate them, but then focus more specifically on the neoliberal era and how we can understand what some people refer to as 21st century fascism. And to begin with then, from the earlier sessions, one of the things that we've seen is that there is a kind of logic of dual governance that is operative in capitalist gangster states or liberal states, if you want to call them that. And that within these states, there's not simply one form of government that is applied to the entire masses of the population within a given territory, but instead there are at least two modes of governance. Uh, there is in its most concise form, we could say, rights and modes of formal representation for those that the ruling class try to govern hegemonically, meaning through consensus. But there is also, uh, class-based racist police and vigilante repression that targets specific sectors of the working classes, particularly the racialized underclass and insurgent revolutionaries um, when the ruling class decides to target them. In relationship to that, there are at least four different forms of these more fascistic modes of governance that we've identified. State fascism is when the state apparatus itself is taken over and there's an open dictatorship of capital, right? And we've talked about some of the tactics to struggle against that, like United Front, Popular Front, I won't go into the others that we've talked about. But there's also fascist and fascistic repressive state apparatus, meaning the ways in which the police forces of liberal states will often act in modes of governance or perform modes of governance that I think can be qualified as we were talking about with Huey Newton's uh, analysis of the Panthers position as being fascist or fascistic, at least in relationship to particular targeted communities. And again, we talked about a number of tactics for struggling against this. This can be legal class struggle, national committees to combat fascism, armed self-defense, anti-police terror initiatives, uh, prison organizing, et cetera. We've also talked about parastate fascism. So extremist militias and vigilantes that are allowed to act with impunity by the liberal state. Um, the tactics that we've discussed to combat this are somewhat similar. There's legal class struggle, of course, there's armed self-defense, there's the revolutionary commune that we were talking about in the work of George Jackson. And the fourth uh, form of fascism that I'd like to identify is imperial fascism. And that is from an internationalist perspective, I think it's a mistake to analyze particularly a country like the United States only in terms of how it governs its domestic population, but we need to uh, incorporate into that analysis the way in which certain liberal states like the United States supports various fascist forms of governance, if it be state fascism, fascistic repressive state apparatuses, or parastate fascism around the globe. And so the tactics that um, we can identify for struggling against these imperialist supports of fascist modes of governance of course include anti-imperialist and anti-war activism, the defense of the right of self-determination of people, revolutionary internationalism, uh, et cetera. And of course, that was one of the reasons that the mobilization last Saturday was so important. And again, I hope that everybody was in the streets uh, contributing to that and, um, and uh, combating uh, precisely one of the forms of uh, repressive state violence that of course the US is, is pivoting more and more towards with the focus on, on China. Overall though, I think it is also important as a recap to identify that these are all different modes of fascistic governance and tactics that can be used to keep those modes of governance at bay as much as possible. But it's equally important to recognize that the strategy for truly defeating fascism is, I think, or can be summed up most coherently in the great slogan, fascism is the symptom, capitalism is the disease, socialism is the cure, right? So we can distinguish between tactics for beating back fascism versus strategies to keep fascism, well, to defeat it entirely. And revolutionary socialism, I think, is undoubtedly the, uh, the antidote uh, 
to that. Now, with this overall framing in mind, what I'd like to turn to more specifically for this session is fascism in the neoliberal era. And there were a number of questions by the people who registered for the course about what fascism in, under neoliberalism looks like, or even if it exists as such. So let's begin with a brief description of what I take to be the most coherent account of neoliberalism, and that is a materialist political economic account of a specific phase of capitalist accumulation. So neoliberalism, I think, can be best understood as a new phase of capitalist accumulation that emerged in the wake of the economic crisis of the early 1970s, and it simultaneously functioned as a counterinsurgency tactic against the anti-systemic movements of the 1960s and early 1970s. It sought to solve the economic crisis of capitalism, as well as the political crisis of the insurgent fight back against capitalism, by reorganizing the capitalist economy through the globalization of production, right? Moving factories overseas, seeking out new labor pools, breaking up factories as sites of organizing, et cetera. The digitalization and financialization of the economy, the dismantling of the welfare state and the privatization of everything under the sun. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, this project of capitalist restructuring went into overdrive, no longer held back by the need to maintain even the appearance of offering a better alternative to Soviet style socialism with its guaranteed education, healthcare and employment. If we understand then that neoliberalism is this new phase of capitalist accumulation that served this dual purpose of saving capitalism by going global, while also fighting back against these insurgent uh, revolutionary uprisings, obviously in the United States, but around the world in the long 1960s. It's important to understand that this was also a restructuring of the capitalist world order in the wake of the welfare state that had kind of dominated the capitalist countries from approximately 1930 to 1970. And without going into great detail about the welfare state, this was, I think best understood as a class compromised by the capitalist core that combined uh, Fordism and Keynesianism to stabilize the economy. The idea being that if we gave workers a minimum so that they could consume within the capitalist economy and provided them with a social net, we could keep workers acquiescent and rule them. This is from the point of view of the capitalist ruling class, of course, not from my own point of view, through hegemony or through consensus. Now, as neoliberalism went about dismantling the welfare state, right, and uh, rendering labor pools more and more precarious, this led to a very significant re material reconfiguration of social relations. Um, beginning in the, in the 1970s. And so if we want to understand fascism in this particular phase, I think that we have to root the specific ideological formations of fascism in this material reconfiguration of the capitalist order. In other words, we have to analyze the infrastructure of neoliberal capitalism to see how uh, neoliberal fascism in its specific ideological form is a product of that material base. And so there are two, I think, dominant neoliberal ideologies that we can identify. One I'm going to be very quick on, but would be happy to discuss in greater detail. That is that there's a rampant liberal ideology of vulgar multiculturalism and identity politics that excludes questions of class and instead focuses on an in the individual as an atomized identity that needs to be represented or recognized in terms of a set series of um, identified, um, you know, identities to be uplifted, so to speak, but without addressing the material basis for the minority status of those identities in the first place. This I'm going to leave aside though, to focus on the reactionary ideology of the ne neoliberal era, which I think is, can both best be described in terms of the white power movement 
that really emerged in the 1970s. Now, the white power movement developed in the wake of the Vietnam War, and this was in the midst of the economic turmoil that I just mentioned, as well as increasing distrust of the US government and extant institutions. These were uh, years in which the right-wing fringe began to lose a certain amount of faith in the state because there was a sense that they could no longer be trusted due to the loss of the war in Vietnam, right? This is very different than in the wake of World War II, if thinking about uh, how that ideology was consolidated, as well as the Watergate scandal and other problems that the US government was having in, in maintaining its kind of hegemonic rule over the citizenry. Moreover, legislation in the US dramatically increased immigration and many on the right worried about the arrival of immigrants and changes to the meaning of American identity. They saw moreover the insurgent movements of the 1960s and 1970s around questions of race, gender, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism as a real threat to the American way of life. And they also noted with alarm the US government's failure to help those who had lost their farms to the banks and their factories to faraway places, right? So there are real material reasons driving some of these right-wing fascist ideologies. Um, the mainstream right and left took up some of these concerns in various ways, um, but so did this troubled kind of extreme right-wing take up and react to these economic consequences. Kathleen Bellieu has written a very interesting book called Bring the War Home that I recommend while also flagging the fact that it is uh, structured within the framework of a liberal ideology, so there are clear limitations to it. But what she highlights is a kind of unification of these extreme right-wing forces and their ideology around 1979. And there was a declaration, an internal declaration on, in 1983 to declare a quote unquote revolutionary war on the government that then transitioned into a militia phase in the early 1990s when the white power movement mobilized its adherents using a very expansive uh, social network. And these activists began training in paramilitary camps. They undertook assassinations. They were involved in mercenary soldiering in very interesting ways. A lot of them were Vietnam vets or vets from the Korean War. So they had military training and military background. Some of them continued working as mercenaries, uh, particularly within the Latin American death squads that were backed by the United States. And so we also have to understand the right power, the, the I'm sorry, the white power movement as not just an organic movement from below, but as a movement that has very strong ties to the military, veteran networks, as well as to the ongoing interests of US imperialism. Um, they were also involved in armed robberies, counterfeiting, various forms of weapons trafficking. Um, one of the key moments in this regard, and this is kind of leading up to some of the things that we'll want to discuss for the 21st century, is the 1979 shootings in Greensboro, North Carolina, when neo-Nazis and Klansmen who were part of the white power movement fired upon a communist organized death to the Klan rally and killed five people. But an all white jury acquitted the killers. What's interesting as well is that Eddie Dawson, who was a longtime Klansman, an occasional FBI and police informant, actually spurred on a lot of the movement around Greensboro. And so one of the things that I think is really important for us to understand is that this white power movement wasn't simply allowed to act with more or less impunity by the liberal state, but there were often forms of aiding and abetting these movements internally through what are called FBI informants, but what these people are, are their agents provocateurs. There are people who join the movements and then often get weapons, are involved in the training and make all of the connections necessary and often instigate the acts of violence themselves. Bernard Butkovich is another example who was an alcohol and tobacco and firearms agent who was working undercover and suggested the illegal activities that led to, um, or at least allegedly led to the shootings in Greensboro, right? So this wasn't simply an uh, kind of uh, 
right-wing militia movement from below, so to speak. It's in 1983 and 1984 that the order, one of these right-wing uh, fascist organizations in the United States and the Aryan nations, another one of them, declared an open war on what these organizations call the Zog, Z-O-G. The Zog is the Zionist occupation government, right? It's this idea that, you know, it's an anti-Semitic depiction of the US government as being controlled by this kind of liberal fraction that is breaking with the principles of the kind of American constitution and whatnot. And the Republican in the strict sense of the term that I described in an earlier session, that is the oligarchic forms of rule that uh, many of these organizations want to maintain. And this declaration of war led to um, what would develop in the later 80s and the early in, and in the 90s, the, the white power militia movement. One of the key moments in this is in 1988, there was the Fort Smith sedition trial. And again, all of this is in the outline if, if you're having trouble following any of the details. Um, when 14 white supremacists, and these were some of the leaders of the major white power uh, organizations, plotted to overthrow the Zog. They were going to overthrow the Zionist occupation government. Um, however, they were in the sedition trial acquitted again by an all white jury. According to Kathleen Bellieu, quote, the Fort Smith trial represented the only attempt at prosecuting white power as a coherent social movement, right? So we see the same pattern. Other key movements include, or other key moments moving up towards the present were 1992 and 1993, there was the Ruby Ridge and the Waco incidents, as well as the development of the militia movement. And in the wake of Ruby Ridge and Waco, the militia movement surged to as many as 50,000 members in 47 states. And they increasingly focused on violent action to stop the federal government. Uh, one of the Southern Poverty Law Center analysts estimated that some 5 million people considered themselves part of the Patriot Movement, militias and militia uh, sympathizers in the mid 1990s. And of course, one of the key moments in this in the 90s is the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. And again, there are very suspect links between these militia organizations and the US national security state, in particular in the case of the Oklahoma City bombing. Carol Howe was an undercover informant who claimed that her warnings about the coming bombing were suppressed. And Gore Vidal has found evidence that the FBI did not follow up on any of its leads, disregarded evidence, and withheld crucial evidence in the trial of the Oklahoma City bombing trying to peg it on basically a single individual or small group of individuals, severing their ties to the larger white power movement and militia movement. So again, we see these, um, I guess what I'm getting at is the porosity between parastate forms of fascist uh, organizations and then the liberal state. In 2015, of course, there's the Dylan Roof's Charleston church shooting and in 2021, the siege of the Capitol. Now, with all of this in mind, the next thing that I'd like to turn to is that based on what we've examined even just briefly, as well as some of the earlier cases that we discussed, such as the fascist plot to overthrow the US government in the mid 1930s, Operation Gladio in Europe that was modeled on Operation Northwoods, which was planned but never executed as far as we know within the United States. It's extremely important not to be hoodwinked by the political theater of the capitalist gangster state. The white power movement in the neoliberal era and in general, domestic US parastate fascism often operates in very close complicity with the state or certain uh, elements within the state, particularly the national security state. It is not only that the parastate fascism in the US is often orchestrated by current or ex-military or police agents, but it is also the case that the US national security state has often had a direct though hidden hand in these parafascist, I'm sorry, parastate fascist organizations, as I was saying earlier. I think I mentioned this in one of the earlier sessions, but a very good example of this is in the analysis that Churchill and Wall provide in their book, the COINTELPRO papers, 
They claim that as of late 1964, the KKK was probably under the control of the FBI since 1964 to the present. The FBI boasted 2,000 informants in the KKK, which was the equivalent of approximately 20% of Klan members in the South. To take another example of this, that's of a slightly different sort, but points again to the porosity of the uh, capitalist gangster state and the need to see through some of the political theater that it tries to govern us with, there is an important study done by the Center on National Security at Fordham Law School um, that found that there have been 138 terrorism or national security prosecutions involving informants since 2001. What this means is in the 21st century, nearly every major terrorist related prosecution, prosecution has involved a sting operation at the center of which is a government informant. And in these cases, the informants who work for money and are seeking leniency on criminal charges of their own have often crossed the line from merely observing potential criminal behavior to encouraging and assisting people to participate in plots that are largely scripted by the FBI itself. All of this means then that, uh, again, in outlining these kind of four different forms of fascism in the recap that I provided, I think it's important to highlight the fact that these are simply heuristic distinctions, meaning they are distinctions that allow us to identify different forms, but at the same time, at the level of materialist analysis, we have to recognize that they often intersect and overlap in concrete cases. If we turn then more specifically to what a number of scholars and activists are calling 21st century fascism, it is also important to recognize that this white power movement that I was charting out in the neoliberal era also segues with a whole series of international developments in the 21st century. Obviously we have Trumpism in the United States, but we also have fascist or fascistic or authoritarian governments in Europe, you know, the cases of Poland, Hungary, um, France with the, um, the National Front. We have Israel, Turkey, Colombia, the Philippines, Brazil, the Modi government in India. Now, without going into any of the details, I simply want to point out that there is a case to be made that a more authoritarian or repressive mode of rule is increasingly operative within capitalist states. And a question that we need to ask is what are the root causes for what seems to be an increasing involvement with the more repressive aspects of capitalist rule? One argument that can be made is that in the neoliberal era, there was a moment, particularly in the 1980s and the 1990s, when it seemed that the capitalist ruling class was able to consolidate at least a minimal form of hegemony. And by this, I just simply mean, you know, probably the most succinct definition of hegemony, which of course comes from the work of Antonio Gramsci, is when a class or a class fraction, so like the ruling class or a part of it, is able to present its own interests as the interests of society in general, right? So all of the rampant ideological discourse about the end of history and democracy and the end of socialism and all of this in the 1980s and 1990s seemed to suggest at least to some that neoliberal hegemony was going to be consolidated because there was going to be an opportunity to rule through consensus. But an important aspect of this is, as Gramsci points out, hegemony or rule by active consent always needs to be constantly reconstructed and it requires a material foundation, meaning that it requires some material basis in reality that can justify consensual, the consent of the governed. If we go back to some of the things I was talking about earlier with the dismantling of the welfare state, the increasing um, uh, shift uh, outside of the United States of sites of uh, manufacturing and production, not all of them, of course, but very significant shift, 
um, and other changes that I'll get into it in a moment, it is arguable that the material base for neoliberal hegemony has been withering away slowly but surely due to the capitalist ruling class's naked pursuit of profit. This of course has been intensified in the wake of the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, as I had mentioned earlier. And so with this in mind, I think that we can identify as well some of the material factors that are driving both the turn towards more authoritarian forms of rule in certain instances and the prevalence of fascist or fascistic ideologies within the general population, right? If, there, if people do not have reliable and affordable access to housing, education, healthcare, consistent work, and a pension, then there needs to be an account for why that is happening. And so if we look even more specifically at some of the potential differences between the fascism that we were talking about in the early 20th century and 21st century fascism, it seems that uh, there's an argument to be made that the base for this new form of fascism isn't perhaps quite as much the petty bourgeoisie that we were talking about in the interwar period in Europe, but uh, instead certain historically privileged sectors of the global working class, such as white workers in the global north or the urban middle layers in the global south, who have been experiencing heightened insecurity and the threat of downward mobility and socioeconomic uh, uh, destabilization. So this shift, I think, is an important aspect of understanding the specificity of what's going on in the 21st century. But it's also true that the communist threat that was operative in the interwar period is arguably not as great. And so some analysts and activists have suggested that this turn to more authoritarian forms of rule um, is instead of a reaction to the communist threat is almost like a preemptive strike against working people and mass resistance. And another aspect of this that is important, I think, from a material level to understand is what's referred to as the development of a global surplus population. And by that, I mean the and here I'll quote um, the work of William I. Robinson and his book, Global Police State, where he claims, and of course he's building on a large body of literature on the surplus population. He says that, and this is an analysis of the specificity of, of um, the working and toiling masses under neoliberal globalization. Quote, those who suffer, this is a description of the surplus population, those who suffer from a long-term structural un or underdevelopment the mass of people who eke out a living or don't even manage to do so in the informal economy of the slums of the world's megacities, as well as the international refugees whose internally displaced, I'm sorry, those internally displaced by wars, repression and natural disasters, migrant workers who may be forced underground and unable to enter the formal labor market, end quote. This, a uh, surplus population poses a problem to the capitalist ruling class, even though of course, this is a problem that has been generated by international capitalist social relations in the first place. And so it's also important to recognize that what many call militarized accumulation is a quote unquote solution to the surplusing of humanity under neoliberal capitalism. By militarized accumulation, I mean basically two things. One is the growing importance of forms of repression as a site of capitalist accumulation. This can be capitalist accumulation through the mass incarceration system, through the war on drugs, through immigration detention centers, through the war on terrorism. There's massive investment, uh, building a wall on the border and other such things, right? Um, but at the same time, militarized accumulation functions as a counterinsurgency strategy against the surplus population. It disciplines those who are being inclusive, uh, those who are being increasingly excluded from formal 
labor markets, right? And so this aspect of militarized accumulation, I think, is a very important factor in understanding the specificity of fascistic modes or fascist modes of governance under uh, neoliberal capitalism. What I'd like to turn to next is um, the question of if this ideology of a kind of neoliberal fascism is rooted in the material consequences of downward mobility of certain historically privileged sectors of the working class. And it's also of course generated and promulgated by the capitalist ruling class in certain regards because it serves their ends. Then one essential question is how do you fight this ideology, right? Especially if it's based in certain material realities uh, like those of not having access to reliable healthcare, job, pension, et cetera. Uh, Corey from Seattle, one of the questions that they raised in as a registering for the course was, how do we best respond to people who say that the working class in the United States, or at least the so-called white working class, and this is a really important quote because there's a lot of denigration of workers and of the so-called white working class and a propaganda campaign around that that also needs to be unpacked, so I'll just flag that. But how do we deal with the fact that they're um, presented as being incurably reactionary and tend toward fascism rather than class solidarity? I think this is a very important question and point because particularly within liberal forms of organizing or the liberal media, there's a tendency simply to demonize fascist ideology as purely evil, profoundly stupid, um, just you know, that these people are complete nut jobs and don't have any basis in reality. And of course, if we talk about QAnon and other such things, you know, there are things that are part of this ideology that can strike one as, as being completely outlandish. But what's important, I think, from the point of view of struggling against this ideology is trying to identify the, what Gramsci refers to as the kernels of truth that are embedded within common sense. Uh, common sense, you know, very simplistically is something along the lines of a dominant ideology that people just get kind of indoctrinated into. And I think that it is true that there are certain tiny fragments of truth that can be teased out. Juan, if you could share, I know this might appear like a funny image to share in this regard, but the duck rabbit image, um, just as I'm talking, because it'll help elucidate one of my points. Um, the, what I'd like to draw on is the ways in which there are factors that are driving some of this fascist ideology, like economic downward mobility and a concern with not having the material conditions necessary to live a sustained and fulfilled life, like get food for your kids and, and other such things. And so the duck rabbit image, I think, is helpful for understanding how ideology often functions as a gestalt. And a gestalt is simply a, a form, a way of representing something, giving it a frame, right? And so the lines in the duck rabbit image don't change. The material reality is the same. But depending on the gestalt that you use, the frame of vision that you use, you can see it as a duck or you can see it as a rabbit. Right, And in being able to see those different frames, what's important about that is material reality stays the same. It's the ideological framing that changes that material reality and makes it into something different. So for instance, in doing outreach and encountering, and I'm also drawing on, I grew up on a farm in Kansas and um, went to high school with a lot of very right wing uh, individuals. And one of the things that I always found frustrating is that there were certain things that these people would say or that people often say who are on the extreme right wing. For instance, there is a governmental conspiracy against the general population. You could argue that there's a truth to that, a certain truth to that. There's a new world order driven by globalization. There's a certain truth to that. There are extreme socioeconomic problems in this country that need to be solved. Very true. The news produced by the ruling elite is generally fake. There's a lot of truth to that. Uh, even some of the critiques that right-wingers uh, um, lodge against liberals have certain grains of truth, right? And so I think that um, one of the problems 
with fascist ideology in the neoliberal era is it takes certain truths and it frames them in a gestalt that is pseudo-scientific and it provides an explanatory framework that seems to explain where these truths come from and how to deal with them. But what it ultimately does is it serves the interest of the capitalist ruling class. And so I'd like to draw on, as I'm sure you're familiar with, because it's a very common outreach tactic in uh, the PSL, the great statements made by Mao about the logic of unity, struggle, unity, right? So in interacting with fascists, we can have unity around some of these material truths that I mentioned, but then struggle with them around the ways in which these are actually framed. So validate what's true, criticize it because of its incorrect framing, and then reframe it in a much more, much more coherent and scientific gestalt, right? So we could say, for instance, yes, there's a governmental conspiracy, but the fundamental problem isn't liberals or the Zog, it's the capitalist system and the bourgeois democracy. Or neoliberal globalization is pernicious, but ultranationalism is not the solution, socialism and internationalism. Uh, there are severe socioeconomic problems, but these are not caused by immigrants or racialized groups. It's the capitalist ruling class which uses these groups as scapegoats that is actually at the root of these problems. We can say that fake news exists. You know, I put this in quotes, um, but it is not blind belief in one market niche of the capitalist media apparatus, right, Fox and Company, that will save us from it. It is a scientific critique of the entire apparatus and in, uh, the media apparatus and an identification of forms of rigorous and reliable journalism. So big shout out here to the socialist program, Breakthrough News, By Any Means Necessary, Empire Files, all the other great stuff that comrades are involved in. And so I'm arriving at the end of my time. And the final thing that I'd like to do in, in about five minutes, if I can, is um, January 6th, in relationship to this and all of the history that we've been talking about, the only thing I'd like to do is raise about four or five questions that I think are really important for us to be thinking about, primarily because we don't really know enough of exactly what happened. And also because we have the advantage of having Brian on the call, who's going to address some of these things more explicitly. One thing that I'll point out, and this is just really a series of questions, state forces were involved. So the question is to what extent and what were their objectives, right? Only one fifth of Capitol Police on duty, the deployment of National Guard was delayed, DHS agents were on standby but not deployed. The Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy delayed, you know, the um, deployment. So it seems like it went pretty high. Um, Yogananda Pittman, who's the acting Capitol uh, Police Chief, has admitted that there was a multi-tiered failure by law enforcement. Second question, how extensive and significant are the links between these parastate fascist organizations and the state, right? We know that Enrico Tario, the chairman of the Proud Boys since 2018, served as an FBI inform or I'm sorry, an informant to federal and local law enforcement, um, as well as other Proud Boy organizers like Joseph Biggs. We also know that a very high number of current military police officers were involved. And Mike German, a former FBI agent and a fellow at the Brennan Center of Justice, pointed out that some of those involved in the Capitol riot had been involved in similar incidents in recent years and have been repeatedly caught on tape. He's on record as saying, quote, we know their names, we know their crim criminal histories. They've been doing it because the police have been letting them do it. They've been doing it because the FBI have been letting them do it, end quote. Third question, what's the relationship between the capitalist ruling class as well as its various factions, right? Um, I think it's clear that the capitalist ruling class has lined up behind the Biden administration, but there are certain very reactionary elements of the capitalist ruling class, um, such as the um, Republican billionaire, Robert Mercer, um, the Dorr brothers, the Koch families, um, the DeVos family, who were funding the, um, anti the lockdown protesters. Right? And so what elements in the capitalist ruling class were interested in pursuing this more right-wing solution? Fourth, 
How has the political establishment used this incident of the Capitol siege as a faith in government campaign? Meaning how have they presented the US government now, the current administration as being the great defender of our sacred democracy, putting this in quotes, while simultaneously using it as cover to shift its policies decisively to the right. In other words, has the logic of the lesser of two evils allowed the Biden administration to be just that much more evil? And my very closing comment is that when you look back at the last year of kind of class struggle within the US, uh, there was a threat of the Sanders campaign, right? The capitalist ruling class was able to dodge that threat. There was also the crisis from the point of view of the capitalist ruling class that was the black proletarian insurgency of the summer and fall of 2020. So the capitalist ruling class had a number of problems on their hands, but in recent months, they've been able to ensconce a right-wing version of the Obama of Obama in the White House, whose administration has already accomplished wonderful things for the ruling class, especially when compared to the Sanders threat or a true like proletarian insurgency. And I'm sure that we're all familiar with a long list of things that Biden has done in office or not done that were based on his, his promises. And none of this, of course, is to suggest that the um, you know, that the current situation is one in which it's not much, much better <laughs> that the capitalist ruling class has lined up behind more hegemonic forms of rule and not decided to go full on fascist. But I think that given all of the things that we've analyzed, these. De pie cantar que vamos a triunfar, avanzan ya banderas de unidad y tú vendrás marchando junto a mí y así verás tu canto y tu bandera florecer la luz de un rojo amanecer anuncia ya la vida que vendrá
enjoyed that. Um, the first song was from Banda Basotti, an Italian rap group, and it's called Anti-Fascist Regarmentation. There, there are um, some translations online, so if you want to go and get the translation of the lyrics, I think you should enjoy it. Um, and then the, the other group was in Tilimani, which a lot of you all know, um, and the song is Pueblo Unido, The People United, which is a, a chant um, in all of our struggles internationally. So I, I hope you enjoyed. So we're gonna go into the intervention from Brian. And um, I hope folks are, I hope folks will continue to take notes and questions um, because we'll have small group discussion and then a larger discussion around what is to be done again, which is a collective, um, it's a collective response. So we need to hear from, from different voices. So thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, comrades, um, and Gabriel and Claudia. Thank you so much for this extensive uh, four-part survey of so many different elements of the of the question of fascism. What I'm going to try to do, and I only have about 15 minutes, so I can't really do that much, but I'm going to try to talk about why we organized this class as a party. Um, of course, it was in the aftermath of, of January 6th. Um, and I want to see if I can address one or two points that I think make the issue somewhat complicated. I mean, it's not somewhat complicated. It's complicated. Uh, as Gramsci said, and as Gabriel mentioned in an earlier segment, there's no universally accepted, nor should we try to have a universally accepted definition of fascism, uh, because all of these processes are are very connected to organic developments within particular societies during periods of capitalism's development and especially during periods of capitalist degeneration. So the particularities of fascism in, in Italy or Germany, much of which mirrors, at least in its racial policies, that, uh, that came from the United States, which was not a fascist country, not a fascist government, uh, show the, the, the organic connection between the two. So with that said, there's, conf there's a, a certain degree of confusion. So what I wanna do is focus on, on what I think, one is the source of the confusion. And secondly, I wanna talk about why this class and why this class now, and then sort of leave it at that. One of the points, and I think that uh, Gabriel mentioned it in the, in the opening talk is he said, he quotes Marx from Capital, volume one in Capital. And uh, the quote is very famous. It's in the Genesis of Capital chapter. Capital comes dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt, talking about the genesis of the capitalist system. And the combined and, and understood characteristic features of capitalism are, are violence. The, the emergence of a market-based system and the bourgeoisie is premised on violence. In the United States, it's an easily discernible pattern because the violence isn't only directed as it was in Europe against the old feudal ruling classes, uh, for which for the most part, the bourgeoisie temporized with them and compromised with them, but occasionally fought them. But in the case of North America, in order for the nascent bourgeoisie to even claim the property, they had to carry out a genocide against the inhabitants of the, of the continent. In order to, uh, to accumulate wealth, it wasn't simply from nature and the application of things from nature uh, using wage labor. It was based on the kidnapping of millions of enslaved people and, or kidnapping and then enslaving people who could only be uh, retained as enslaved people through the exercise of extreme violence. And these characteristic features of capitalism are the things that people associate with fascism. When you think fasci fascism is like a really bad form of capitalism. Well, capitalism is just a really bad form of itself. I mean, capitalism is an exercise in systemic violence. And so when people think that the, the capitalists are being violent, that means they're being fascistic. And we have to correct that uh, misunderstanding. Uh, the United States was at war against fascist Germany and Japan, which was fascist Germany's ally in World War II. 
the Democratic Americans dropped atomic bombs on the city of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, deliberately designed to genocide those cities so that there could be a weapons test. I mean, the, the firebombing of Dresden by the Americans. I mean, uh, at the Nuremberg trial, I think it was Goering, Goering was, was, was being you know, ridiculed by the prosecutor and Goering said to the prosecutor back, well, what was Hiroshima? And the prosecutor told him to shut up. Uh, in other words, these characteristic features that we associate with fascism are really features that we can always associate with capitalism and with, and with class rule. And even prior to capitalism, when the system was feudalism based on organized violence, the state is nothing other than the institutions of organized violence. Same with these societies of antiquity, which were based on slavery, Athenian and, and, and Roman democracy were based on societies where most of the people were enslaved. Uh, how did they retain them as enslaved people? Through the exercise of violence. Some parts of the population got to debate, and got to discuss, and got to vote, and the other parts of the population were slaves. This is the uh, sort of fundamental and foundational element of class society. So when we talk about fascism, um, we can always show there is a connection between fascist violence and, quote, normal capitalist violence, because there is this connection. In, in Europe, fascism arose when, and, and, and the bourgeoisie opted to accept and embrace Hitler, even though Hitler's support in, 19, in the last election in September, or October 1932, I can't remember which it is, the fascist vote was actually diminishing. The communist vote was growing, the social democrats have been losing votes. The fascist vote, it was a disappointment to them. Uh, but the bourgeoisie in Germany opted to embrace Hitler, this mass movement from below, because they decided that they could make a deal with Hitler. And the deal was that Hitler would recognize the industrialists would retain their property. Hitler would recognize that the, that the German military establishment would remain intact. And that Hitler and the stormtroopers and the SA and the SS would do their work in terms of crushing the left and destroying the unions and the Socialist Party and the Communist Party. That was the, the deal, that was the bargain, that was the quid pro quo that the German bourgeoisie made with Hitler, which was a plebeian mass movement from below based on the impoverished petty bourgeoisie for the most part. Some workers, but mainly petty bourgeoisie. Uh, similarly, like when we see the crowd in January 6th, a lot of them were petty bourgeoisie. I mean, how do you get to Washington in the middle of the work week uh, you have to have some means. Uh, you have to be able to get on a plane or a train. You can miss work. You can shut your business down for a couple of days. A lot of even the arrested people were a small business owners. Uh, the woman who was shot to death, uh, she was a small and failing business person. She had been an Obama voter, by the way, in 2008 and 12, which shows that her trajectory was not always rooted in KKK style uh, fascist white supremacist notions. I mean, maybe she was a racist, but the fact is she voted for Obama before. So something happened. And, and the something is that the, the fascist movement in the United States actually has gotten steam. It's, it's grown. And um, Gabriel has made this really important, and Claudia have made this really important demonstration that it's always there. The fascist movement is always kind of there as an auxiliary to the American police state. And the American police state was an open police state in the South, meaning for black people at least, uh, there was not even the pretense of democratic rights. And, and Gabriel talked about these different kinds of governance. But then even after the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, when legal apartheid was ended, when the police state was presumably ended, for the most part, it, it continued. And so the, the essence of the South, while it has changed dramatically, I mean, we shouldn't minimize that, still has these fundamental features. There was a debate in the left over what was the character of the Trump administration. I'm sure the comrades were aware of the group Refuse Fascism, which was started by the Revolutionary Communist Party, RCP, Maoist, Baba Vakian leads the group. They developed a thing, a, a movement called Refuse Fascism and insisted that everybody on the left actually support Joe Biden because 
Trump were to be reelected, it would be fascist. Now, that's the same position formally, by the way, not, not the same position, but similar to the position of the CPUSA, Communist Party. They were also for voting for Biden. Freedom Road Socialist Organization, also for voting for the Democrats. Um, there's a, a, a tendency uh, to conflate ultra-right forms of governance with fascism and then say, if we want to stop fascism, we have to do whatever it takes, whatever practical means are available to stop the ascension of an ultra-right government. And on that basis, we have to, you know, hold our noses and support the Democrats because the option is we're going to, the country will become fascistic. PSL did not think this about Trump. If Trump had been reelected, it would have been a hard right uh, second term of the administration, but not fascism. And by that, I mean, it wouldn't have been like Germany or Italy after the triumph of Mussolini or Hitler uh, in the 20s in the case of Italy or 1933 in the case of Hitler. At that time, the ascent of the, the victory of fascism meant the evisceration of the working class organizations, the destruction of the mighty Communist Party, the destruction of the mighty Socialist Party, the destruction of those unions. Every element of working class mobilization was completely eviscerated. The concentration camps ev eventually led to the genocide against Jews and Roma people and uh, LGBTQ people, but the, the, the concentration camps at first and the, and the repression at first was for the left. That was what it was for. If Trump had been elected, this would not have been the case, comrades. That was not an accurate assessment. And we can't conflate a right-wing government with a fascist government, and that's a perennial danger in the American left because it always leads to supporting or becoming a tail for the Democratic Party. It always does that. Even Michael Parenti, who we study and had, did a great work, we had a debate with him in 1984 because he ended up thinking Reagan was going to be like uh, the worst. And as a consequence, uh, he, he told the left to support Mondale in 1984, which is pretty shocking. But it's the same process that replicates itself in American left politics over and over and over again. And thus the left loses its independence and loses its ability to have a class analysis of what's going on out of this fear of fascism because it conflates fascism and ultra-right governments that are not fascist and thus considers them to be in, in equal danger. So we don't wanna do that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons we haven't really studied fascism before because we actually agree with Huey P. Newton and the point that Gabriel mentioned in the last class where the Panther said, the real problem isn't the ultra-right fascist clan, Nazi or whatever. The real problem is the cops. The real problem is the police. The real problem is the racist state, which does far more damage to uh, the black community and to the working class and to other oppressed sectors than the ultra-right. And, 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 you know, that, that has been our historic orientation as well. We've also made the argument that, the, that the, the bourgeoisie, at least on the home front, Gabriel's right, like you can't really distinguish British democratic rule at home or in, in India from what it would have been like under the Nazi regime in India. For the colonies, it was the same level of fascistic like governance. It was indistinguishable, but in the home front, it was far different. Now, our position has been that the bourgeoisie, the capitalist ruling class, does not want fascism to, quote, take over. They're glad to have it as a para-fascist force, a para and as an auxiliary force, but the bourgeoisie doesn't want to give up control of the state to the fascists. They want to control the state. They want to manage the state. They are highly class conscious. They believe and know that a fascist takeover is highly unstable because the word that Gabriel was using about hegemony, which is consensus, it's much better to have the oppressed vote every two or four years and select the people who are going to oppress them for the next two or four years so that they have a sense of variety, that they have a sense of choice, that they have consent. That's much less brittle 
then if you, let's say, if you, if you for those of you who are old enough, if, if we learned in 2007 that George W. Bush then hated because of the Iraq war was going to be president for life, that there wasn't going to be a 2008 election, a lot of people would have started an armed struggle in America. I mean, the left, the left would have, this would have gone in the direction of armed struggle. But it's so much better for the bourgeoisie to say, well, look, his term is coming to an end. Now you can vote for Barack Obama or McCain. You know, you have choice. It's a safety valve. It's a much preferred form of class rule. So the bourgeoisie in general only opts, the advanced industrial capitalist bourgeoisie only opts to give the government over to the fascists like they did in Germany when they, know what, when they feel they cannot control the left, when they feel that the left can only be, or the working class can only be regimented through fascist tactics. Um, I wanted to say something about January 6th. How much time do I, did I talk already, Claudia? Or somebody, Juan? You have time, you have about, about five more minutes you can take on. Five minutes is plenty. Okay, so I wanna talk about uh, what actually happened on January 6th and why we uh, present the question and we did it right away. The party took a very strong position. We weren't ambiguous at all. We said, this is a fascist led insurrection designed to overturn the election outcome, the certification of the election. Now, some people on the left said, no, it's not. This was just like an over-enthusiastic mob of right-wingers. There was no real action plan, you know, whatever. We have to look at January 6th at what, what was coming right before January 6th. You know, in the summer, our side, the working class, the multinational working class, we had the initiative. 35 million people were in the streets. Our side was getting stronger and stronger. Uh, Trump wanted to call out, Trump wanted to impose martial law. Remember on June 1st, he, he wanted to impose the Insurrection Act. He wanted to uh, send the military. He was denouncing the governors and mayors for not cracking down. It was like a call for a police state suppression of progressives and the Black Lives Matter movement and the multinational anti-racist movement. But he couldn't do it because our movement just kept getting stronger and stronger and there were divisions and cracks within the bourgeoisie. After the election, actually before the election, but especially after the election, when Trump made the argument using his Twitter account with 88 million followers, that this was a stolen election, that the patriots were denied the, the, the election that they had won, he convinced most of his voters, and there were 73 million of them, that this election had been hijacked, that the, whatever you want to call it, the Zionists, I can't remember the, the Zog, um, or whatever, the big elites, the big bourgeoisie, they had, they had taken the people's democracy away from them. And, and he tried to do everything. He filed lawsuits. Uh, he, he tried to obviously twist the arm of the Secretary of State of Georgia to just find another 10,000 votes. He was doing everything desperate to, to hold on to the office. And our assessment was because of his motivation was that it wasn't fascism. He didn't want to leave office because he would have lost the immunities of the presidency and he was going to be subjected to criminal prosecutions and civil actions in many, many states. That's what his life and his kid's life was going to be. So he's clinging to power. He felt he had command of the Republican Party. His, his, his struggle was really to put pressure on the Republicans to overturn the election. He wanted Republican judges to overturn it. He wanted Mike Pence to overturn it. He wanted the Republican Party establishment to stand with him, and he thought he might be able to get away with it because he had so much popular support. So he started that campaign like a day or two after he lost the election. During that time, the fascist movement in America became very emboldened. In Washington, D.C., the comrades who are on this call from Washington can testify to this. By, by early December, Instead of our side having controlling the streets here in Washington, a city that's still at least 50% black, the fascists were controlling the streets. The Proud Boys were controlling the streets. They were coming to Washington, carrying out violent assaults on progressive people, black people, vandalizing black churches, burning uh, banners from black churches. It was a reign of terror and the police were helping them. The police were not arresting them. The police were arresting their victims. 
And this happened all the way through for the next month. And as a matter of fact, it had become so pronounced that on January 4th, on the night of January 4th, the entire US left in Washington, the Washington left, including the Black Lives Matter organizations, told people who had scheduled to come out and, and demonstrations on January uh, 5th, don't come out, right? I mean, I see Morgan on the, on the call. I mean, that was the mood in Washington. The fascists had control of the streets. They had the president behind them. They had tens of millions of people who were supporting them. Trump's only goal was to remain in office, but he was using the Proud Boys, using the three percenters, using the Oath Keepers in a way that they had not been explicitly used in more than a hundred years. And they were feeling very strong. So on January 6th, they believed that they could breach the Capitol they thought they could take it. They thought the Republicans who were wavering would come around and decertify the vote and that Trump would then use extraordinary measures, including possibly martial law, to either hold a new election or to do a recount using Republican legislators. So what Trump was doing was trying to, for his own narrow purposes, uncertify the election that had been certified by the Electoral College on December 14th and remain in office. And the fascists were the only tool that he had to be able to breach the Capitol to carry out that kind of disruption. Many people were there who were along for the ride, but this was a fascist led operation. These were real fascists. People say, well, why didn't the Capitol Police uh, do anything? Why didn't they get ready? The Capitol Police Union had its annual banquet at the Trump International Hotel a few months earlier. They're Trump people. The Fusion Center, which is this partnership between the FBI and corporations and local cops, these massive fusion centers that were uh, built up after September 11th, they had emergency meetings on the night of June, on January 4th and the 5th. And so did the FBI. And they knew that what was going to happen and they did nothing. I mean, why? That's, we, as Gabriel said, we don't know the full story yet. But it's either there was, there was ideological sympathy for the Trump supporters. They thought of them as, quote, their people. And some of the higher ups were in on the plan and hoping that they could actually get into the Capitol, disrupt the election, and turn right wing Republicans to Trump. I mean, Trump was calling the right wing Republicans while the breach was happening and telling them, are you ready to change your vote? If they had succeeded in overturning the election using a fascist led insurrection, we could very easily have been pushed into another qualitative stage of politics in America, leading to open street conflagrations between as, I, I, I can't remember what the numbers were, but there are tens of thousands of people organized into militia formations and who are right-wing fascists but who are generally considered uh, marginalized, they would have been brought into play. This would have been something unlike anything that's happened. And what the ruling class has done, and I'll conclude with this, is that they have denounced Trump. They took his Twitter account away, which was a <coughs> excuse me, which was a major blow because his his inability to communicate with the base is huge. Uh, he was also completely demonized by his bankers. The capitalist bankers said they're not going to give the Trump organization any more money. Uh, the Republican Party establishment, at least at first, distanced itself from him. All of the right wing judges had voted not to accept his court cases. Uh, and the military issued the statement, that extraordinary statement on January 12th, all eight members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff a letter to every member of 1.3 million members of the military warning them, don't you dare get involved in trying to overturn the election. This will, this will mean that you will be held criminally liable. That means the high command after six days finally spoke out because they realized that there was so much support from within the military, either rank and file or some sectors of the command staff that they actually wanted to make it clear that they weren't going to tolerate it. And also because the rest of the American bourgeoisie had already united against Trump. 
The bourgeoisie considers Trump to have committed the cardinal sin, which is he put his own interests ahead of the interests of the capitalist state, which requires that both of the capitalist parties accept the peaceful transfer of power from one capitalist party to the other, so as to maintain the global image of America as an omnipotent, hegemonic government and not a government like other governments that are you know, routinely torn apart by strife. And that's why uh, he has been cast out. He's been excommunicated, uh, which doesn't mean he can't come back. But at the moment, it's a very, very uh, tall mountain for him to climb. Um, there's so much I didn't cover, and I apologize. And I'm speaking a mile a minute because I'm trying to race. But um, I just wanted to at least go over what our view was of January 6th. As Gabriel also said, and I think Claudia made the point too, having now repressed the fascists, they're being repressed, uh, many on the left will think, good, the capitalist state is getting stronger against fascism, but we should remember the whatever repression is visited upon fascism will be minor in comparison to what will happen to oppressed people, uh, to immigrant communities, to leftists. I, we have to oppose any new anti-terrorism law, anything that really strengthens the hand of the state, which already has all of these tools for repression, will be ultimately used against the left. We do not need now to form a united front with Joe Biden and the capitalist state against fascism, because this is the same perennial problem that the left makes in America by not understanding or conflating right-wing government or the state with the actual menace of fascism. People back for the most part? Okay, great. Welcome back, comrades. Just in interest of time, there's been some fantastic questions, but we're going to just focus on a few of them very quickly, and then we want to hear back from you. I believe it was uh, Morgan who highlighted the ways in which there's a series of films, First Blood, Rambo, Predator, I'd add Red Dawn, that have really facilitated the rise of certain fascist ideologies. And I, I wanted to highlight the central importance of these films to the movement. Red Dawn is unbelievably important for mobilizing major sectors of the like fascist militia movement. And so when we're thinking about fascism, we can't only think in terms of the kind of, um, ideological war and the militant war itself, but also the cultural war and cultural struggle as a, as a central focal point. It's one of the reasons that the um, all of the cultural products that Claudia shared with us are so fantastic in uh, illustrating part of what the fight back looks like. The other question I want to touch on very briefly was uh, Nino asked, how should we or could we position ourselves at this stage, not even one year into the Biden administration, one of the ways that I've been thinking about the relationship between the liberal state and fascist modes of governance is that they often operate in terms of the logic of the kind of good cop, bad cop interrogation tactic, meaning that the bad cop will be brought in the kind of fascist or authoritarian repressive forces in order to discipline those who act out or target particular populations. But the good cop is there in order to act as if the rule of law was being maintained and they were ruling in our best interest, right? But what's really important for us to recognize is that the good cop, bad cop interrogation tactic functions in such a way that ultimately these people are on the same team. Obama said it when Trump came into office. At the end of the day, we're on the same team, said it honestly. And when we recognize that, we go to the root causes of these fascistic modes of governance, and that is the capitalist system that uses different modes of governance in order to either make a population acquiescent or to repress it in very, very direct ways. The last thing that I'd say is this is actually a great moment for organizing in certain ways because of the ways in which the um, capitalist ruling class sunk the Sanders campaign, brought in Biden, and is really pursuing an agenda in which a lot of people feel left behind. And these are people that we can bring into our struggles and radicalize them and point out that we have to go to the root causes of this system and not simply think that we can address it at a reformist level or an incremental fashion. But I'll turn it over to Brian, who's gonna address one of the other questions. Vanessa, who asked, how do we relate to so-called Antifa tactics, doxing open fascists, countering protesting fascist rallies, et cetera? What's our position in relationship to those types of anti-fascist organizing? 
Yeah. So there's a there's a couple there's some experiences that we have. I mentioned the one about August 12, 2018, when the fascists were coming to Washington. We insisted on being where the fascists were, not to cede any ground. Some people were afraid to go there. So different left groups were saying, "We'll meet two blocks away," and we were like, "No, be right where they are, not somewhere else." But the thing was not to have a struggle between PSL and the fascists. The thing was to organize the masses of people to come out and to do that on a, on a progressive program. And when you can do that, when you have the power of the people, uh, then you the relationship of forces shifts. That can, that's different in different places. If you're in a, uh, a very right-wing area or a rural area, the relationship of forces isn't going to be favorable. Uh, but certainly you would think that in major urban areas, it certainly will be. Uh, and the question is, you know, if anarchist tactics are largely uh, self-defeating tactics uh, to get into small group skirmishes and to emphasize the military element of battle with the, with the fascists is basically, I mean, it could be satisfying and there's nothing wrong with physically attacking fascists um, in some moral way, but as a, as a tactic, I think it's self-defeating. It's, and it, and it reduces the struggle between two groups. Like there's the Antifa group and then the Proud Boys, as opposed to like really presenting it as this is the working class, the multiracial working class that needs housing, healthcare, jobs, and peace versus this group of retrograde, you know, right-wing white supremacist, you know, patriarchal fascists. I mean, it's, we shouldn't present it as two groups fighting each other. We need to organize and mobilize the class, which doesn't mean we don't go where they are. We had a lot of, uh, Gabriel talked a lot about the 80s. Uh, I was doing mainly anti-fascist organizing in 1982, 83, 84. I was in Texas and Georgia. I mean, there, you know, in essence, it was, uh, we were doing mass mobilizing and it also had to be an armed struggle, frankly. You couldn't really go around and not be conspicuously armed because you would be shot at. So, uh, you know, we had, to, we had to combine those tactics. In the case of Boston in 1974, not the South, Boston, we organized the masses against the anti-busing movement, which were racist, fascists rooted in East and South Boston. That was a mass movement, um, and, but the fascists were carrying guns. And at a certain point, uh, there was gunfire. And at a certain point, you have to be prepared. Uh, but the way we defeated the fascists in Boston was not by having shootouts with them uh, or skirmishes. It was by we mobilized people from all over the United States to come to Boston and to say no to racism. And that showed black and white people standing up. That turned the tide where the liberal bourgeoisie like the Kennedys were kowtowing to the fascists because the, of the social pressure was so great. So we have a lot of different tactical experiences. If you're in a union, let's say you're in a union. Uh, the steel workers who were historically voting Democrat by maybe 60 to 40 percent, according to the, our friends and the steel workers, that, that number reversed because Trump's tariffs were very popular. How do you go in and fight against right wing or ultra right wing ideology with your coworkers uh, who are also exploited, also oppressed, but taken in tow by the, the xenophobic nationalist position? That's not essentially a military battle between fascists and anti-fascists. That's an ideological struggle with your coworkers and you have to win them over. Uh, the finally, the Communist Party in the South, which if you wanna talk about fascist-like conditions, I mean, what was more fascistic than Alabama in the 1930s? Uh, the, the sharecroppers union that was formed by the CPUSA, which you can read about in, um, in Hammer and Ho, the book Hammer and Ho, uh, which shows the, the level of communist organizing. They organized ex klansmen to come into the sharecroppers union, which was a black led organization. That was a mass organization led by, by black sharecroppers. And it had thousands of poor whites who were brought into it because the CPUSA, which had a black leadership was fundamentally an underground organization in Alabama. Uh, they were, had a class orientation. So they didn't give up on any of the workers. And uh, the, the poison of white supremacy couldn't have been greater than it was right there in Alabama. So it was a battle for ideas uh, and not just simply a physical battle and, and just doxing people or small, small skirmishes. I don't think, I don't consider that to be 
effective or a good use of time. Thank you so much, Brian and Gabriel. So we have a minute from Brian and Gabriel, and then we'll close. I'm going to be very quick. I just wanted to thank all of the comrades, both all of those who put all the work into planning and putting this class on, and then all of those who participated, because it really is a collective endeavor. I've learned a lot myself, and I think it's so great to have this feedback loop and to be able to work with comrades like you. And the last thing that I wanted to say is that it's also so important that we're not people who are waiting for fascism to almost you know, see state power, but we're already building power within a party and within the various communities that we're anchored in. And this is one of the most important things that we can do right now. And so I'm very honored and pleased to have been able to contribute to and participate in this conversation. And I take it that it's gonna be an ongoing struggle. And that's all that I have to say. So thank you so much for your contributions and keep up the great work and keep up the fight. Thank you. And, and I want to thank uh, Gabriel uh, and Claudia, who I approached a long time ago and asked if they would be willing to take on this class after January 6th. Uh, we think the study of fascism, like the study of all parts of the class struggle, are critically important. Uh, you, you don't mainly learn from the class. The class, as Claudia said in the beginning, should be a stimulant to or a, like a support mechanism so that you can continue your own individual study or your own study with other close comrades with you. Um, if you think about the last year, we had you know, 35 million people in the streets in June and July, and then the, the momentum shifted, the bourgeoisie sort of quieted that movement down, the energy got poured into Biden, then the fascists took the initiative and our side was on the defensive. I mean, just think of how dynamic everything is. The ebbs, the flows, the ups, the downs, the zigs, the zags. I mean, all within you know one year, it's been remarkable. But this is why we need a party because each of these movements and changes, you know, if, if all we do is participate in the mass movement and don't have an organization that learns the lessons of each of these stages, then the, our class has no class memory. We don't learn what happened. We don't learn what worked, what didn't work. There's no memory. Everything starts from scratch over and over again. And that's why we study. That's why we build together. And theory for the PSL is nothing other than the generalized experience of the people, the generalized experience of, of the struggle. It's, that's what our theory is. And so our theory is constantly being refined. And, and as Lenin, always like to say, he said, you know, theory is gray and the tree of life is green, meaning you never know what's coming next. And the ability for a collective, a leadership, which is what the party is, a nationwide leadership, to be able to study together, struggle together, learn together, have additional formulations as a guide to action, which really is what makes Marxism uh, a dynamic force, not simply a doctrine or a dogma, but actually a guide to action for the people. So uh, thank you so much to Claudia and Gabriel, really, really excellent. And again, I hope all the comrades keep their own individual study uh, going on this and, and on the other topics. Well, thank you so much, comrades. Um, Brian, Gabriel, um, I think Nino raised a really important question, which was what is actually to be done in terms of building blocks against fascism or the terms of what would be united popular front. And we, we think, yes, we need to be able to pull ranks. We need to be able to bring people together, um, but we need to bring people together around a socialist position. And this needs to be debated in the public square. Like there shouldn't be hiding of our socialist ideas. Um, the task is to push a socialist project and in doing so, we will make sure to create a poll that is different from an anti-capitalist poll that does not have a social, economic, or political project to advance our class struggle. And that's what makes the difference. Our task is to show the masses that socialism is not only the solution, but that it is possible, that it's economically and political, politically feasible. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, you know, we, not we as a party, but just in the left in general, socialists in general, we always talk about what we're against, but we need to push what we're for. And we need to be able to bring forth the radical imagination that the, the, the socialism that we want to build 
is possible, right? And part of this is what Brian was talking about, which is the battle of ideas. We need to engage in the battle of ideas, but we need to engage in the battle of ideas with our people, with our, our class in a way in which they feel is possible, which means not antagonism. With revolutionary patience, we must love our people dearly to be able to move them from whatever position they are to our position um, with full truths, not half truths. So, we must continue to be connected to our class, committed to our socialist process in working objectively based on the material conditions of our people, which is something that Nick, something that Angel brought up. It is important for us to be clear in our assessment. So we need to study, we need to build contextual analysis. We need to engage in collective debate about what is currently happening. And we need to build competence in the development of our strategy and organizing and mobilizing and developing new leadership where we are. And these are things that we are already doing. So I want us to feel as a party that we are on our way to do this. And there will be contradictions and there will be obstacles, but for as long as we build unity internally, we could also build unity with the class. We want to thank you all for your commitment, this collective experience was amazing and I feel we should continue to replicate spaces like this, um, whether they're virtual or in person when we have the capacity to do so. I wanna thank Brian for approaching us <laughs> and for you know thinking and, and having the clarity and the vision of how needed this conversation was for, for all of us internally. Um, I wanna thank Marissa, Juan, David, and of course, Gabriel for being part of coordinating this process for the course. Um, again, and this goes back to Gramsci, we must use all of our strength, all of our creativity, all of our intellect to organize, to steer, and mobilize our class in, in, in our path towards socialism. And history teaches us that we can and we will win. That is possible, okay? So thank you so much uh, for this class. Our hope is to be able to create this um, in a package so folks could continue to utilize it. We'll be talking with the Liberation School and seeing how that could be done so that the recordings and the materials are available for everyone to be able to replicate the space. Thank you so much. Even seremos. Yes.